Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm thrilled to be here today talking to you folks about what is a bird, uh, a very interesting topic near and dear to my own heart. And we'll just dive right into it, shall we? <clears throat> so first, before we dive into what is a bird, where birds came from, the diversity of birds in Kentucky and more broadly, it's, it's helpful to have a few basic definitions. So what even is a bird? I think most folks <laughs> have a very intuitive sense for what a bird is. You've probably seen a bird today, uh, perhaps even eaten a bird today. Uh, they're, they're ubiquitous in a lot of ways, but it's helpful to have some basic definitions. So all extant birds, birds that we have on earth today are warm blooded. They're all vertebrates, of course, meaning that they have a spine. Birds are all characterized by feathers in some capacity. No species of bird has hair. There are some birds that have hair-like feathers, but feathers are a bird characteristic, at least in terms of contemporary vertebrates. <clears throat> they have toothless beaked jaws. So we know that birds have beaks uh, and not a single extant bird has teeth. Birds lay eggs, of course. No species of bird uh, gives live birth. They have very high metabolic rates, uh, higher than many other vertebrates. Uh, that keeps them warm, that keeps them active. They have a four-chambered heart. They have a highly pneumatized skeleton. Now that's a sort of fancy term for a uh, having hollow bones. So most bird species, we'll talk about some exceptions, have hollow bones, which is a, a, an adaptation for flight, and birds are found on all continents. So, so that's kind of the, the the basic summary of what a bird is but how did we even get here to have uh birds the way they are today well when we think about uh vertebrate uh, animals today a little bit more broadly we tend to think of five main groups of vertebrates <clears throat> now things can get a little bit hairy when you dive into fish uh which we're not going to do <laughs> not much anyway <clears throat> but uh the five main groups that we think of today are amphibians, birds, fish, mammals, and reptiles. So with those five main groups in mind, we can think of where those groups of vertebrates originated. Right now, vertebrates, of course, these are only animals with spines. They're not going to include things like crabs or uh, octopus or insects, things like that. So we've got these five main groups of vertebrate animals, um, and we can plot them out on what's called a, a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. So we can see the relationships among these organisms. And, and I know that this is a little bit technical, but, but uh, I think it's helpful. And I'll, I've got pictures and things that'll <laughs> help us understand this. So, okay, we've got fish. So fish are kind of their own little group. They, there are some different kinds of fish that, again, sort of make things complicated. But fish form a single monophyletic group. They all share a single common ancestor at some point or another. Amphibians, again, there's nothing really strange going on here. Uh, at least to my knowledge, amphibians are, are a single monophyletic group. And again, mammals, uh, by and large, uh, a similar kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> if you look at what we have remaining, the, the turtles, uh, the tuataras, which are somewhat uh, these lizard-like reptiles, squamates, which are snakes and lizards, crocodilians, which I think speaks for itself, and birds. And the situation is a little bit more hairy when it comes to birds. And the reason I say that is because frequently birds are classified as their own group and turtles, tuataras, squamates, and crocodilians are a, a, their own group called the reptiles. But you can see that that's problematic based on this phylogenetic tree because birds are actually sandwiched within reptiles as what we call a sister group to crocodilians. So that presents uh, an interesting problem in the taxonomy of birds and, and vertebrates more broadly, because reptiles, as we currently think of them, are what we call a paraphyletic group. So that means there's a little bit of messiness in there because we are classifying it as a single group while excluding one monophyletic clade that's sandwiched within it, that being the birds. So we call crocodilians reptiles but we call birds birds when in reality birds either should be reptiles or crocodilians should be birds and, and i'll talk a little bit more about why that is so this is that same uh uh, uh tree that we just looked at here 
what we're going to do is we're going to dive into this little bit right here that I've got circled in blue with crocodilians and birds to better understand the origin of birds. So the group that includes crocodilians and birds, uh, and I think the, I'm going to move this window here because it looks like birds are covered up. Um, the group that includes crocodilians and birds are all called the archosaurs or the ruling reptiles. So the archosaurs evolved about 240 million years ago, where we've got crocodilians, we've got pterosaurs, you set pterodactyls, you've got these horned dinosaurs like triceratops and sort of the armored ones like stegosaurus, the long neck sauropods, and then the other theropod dinosaurs, uh, which includes birds and things like tyrannosaurus. So that's that's the whole group called archosaurs. So archosaurs are the group of reptiles within which crocodilians and birds both fall together. Now, birds and other dinosaurs split apart about 160 million years ago from a group that we now call the theropods. So theropod dinosaurs, they split apart about 160 million years ago. It includes things like birds, but also like Tyrannosaurus, uh, Carnosaura, etc. So and one of the first inklings that we had in the scientific community that this might be the case was the discovery of a bird-like dinosaur called Archaeopteryx. And that's a very long, fancy word, uh, but it's, it's actually a very fun one. So um, we're all familiar with, or at least many of us are familiar with the, the, the prefix archae, like archaeology. So archae refers to studying ancient things. So archae is, is ancient. And the pteryx with the silent P, you can think of like pterodactyl, has a silent P at the beginning, PT. Pterodactyl, uh, for instance, uh, means finger wing. So in this case, the, the terra means wing. So we've got ancient wing in the archaeopteryx. And archaeopteryx was discovered in 1860 as a fossil dating back to 145 million years. Sorry, my screen just went black for a moment there. And what Archaeopteryx was, is it is it presented a really unusual situation for scientists, because this, this animal had a combination of both these, these theropod dinosaur-like traits and modern bird-like traits. It had some of each, right? So it had flight feathers. So it, it clearly was, was an animal that could achieve at least some level of flight. It had a fully reversible hallux. Now that's a fancy term for the hind toe on a bird. Think of a chicken, they've got that one hind toe that can fully reverse to the back. They had very reduced fingers, which is, is kind of a precursor to the modern avian wing. It had a large fan-shaped tail, much like birds do. <clears throat> and it had a wishbone, just like a bird. But it also had a bunch of dinosaur-like traits, which was interesting. It had unfused metacarpals and metatarsals. These bone and, and hand, uh, or excuse me, these foot and hand bones were not fused together like they are in a bird. Uh, it did not have a carotenized beak like a bird. It had teeth, which of course, as we've already discussed, no birds have. It had a long unfused tail. So you can see that in the illustration. It had a long tail, almost like a, like a lizard or like a tyrannosaurus, which of course birds don't have. They have a, a compressed uh, uh, tailbone or uh, several small tailbones. And it had a pelvic structure like a dinosaur, uh, unlike what we see in modern birds. So it had this mix of bird and kind of dinosaur type traits. Now, so, that, so that's where we are with respect to uh, the evolution of birds. We saw Archaeopteryx as a kind of intermediate form. That's not to say that birds evolved directly from Archaeopteryx, but Archaeopteryx and birds shared a common ancestor together. And Birds split off from other pteropod dinosaurs <clears throat> 140 million years ago, but what's interesting is feathers evolved well before that, about 190 million years ago. So this begs a series of questions about why dinosaurs that weren't flying uh, had feathers. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is or why that is. We believe feathers are an exception. And I'm gonna talk about what that is. A, a better, uh, more uh, tangible example would be what we see with lungs in fish. So many uh, ancient species of fish, including the modern day lungfishes, 
had actual lungs. And these lungs are what we call homologous to the lungs of, of mammals like ourselves, meaning it's, it's essentially the same structure. So we have lungs, lungfish have lungs that perform in very much the same way. Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> if you go out fishing and catch largemouth bass or bluegill, they don't have lungs, right? They're breathing through gills, whereas lungfish can actually breathe air. Uh, however, modern fish still have that sac in their body that was historically a lung, but it's no longer used as a lung in most modern fish. It's used as a swim bladder. So it's a, it is an, an adaptation, specifically an exception to maintaining buoyancy. So a fish can expand and contract that, uh, that, that lung, that swim bladder to maintain buoyancy at a certain level of the water column without having to swim around. And, and expend energy doing that. So the fact that we've got the same organ being used for two different things in two different organisms is an example of, of an exception. So feathers, we believe, are also an exception. So uh, dinosaurs evolved them to do one thing, and modern birds use them at least in part to do other things. So some possible reasons that uh, modern birds, or I'm sorry, that that dinosaurs that are non-avian had feathers, perhaps insulation. So this is kind of the dino fuzz idea that many dinosaurs perhaps were fuzzy to keep themselves warm. Um, incubation, that's another hypothesis. Uh, we've seen fossil evidence that dinosaurs incubated their, their, their clutches of eggs. So you can see here on the left, a uh, picture of a Canada goose standing over its clutch of eggs uh, that it uses its feathers to uh, incubate. And then on the right, uh, an image of a 150 million year old dinosaur that's in a similar posture hunkered over its eggs. And of course, sexual selection. This is the idea that uh, maybe that dinosaurs had these feathers, perhaps they were colorful or brightly colored in some way, maybe they were white uh, or whatever, uh, as a means for sexual selection. Maybe that's, that's how a male dinosaur attracted a female dinosaur. Of course, these are all speculation, uh, but but potential uh, hypotheses as for why feathers evolved way before flight ever evolved. So where are we today? Well, uh, we've got this same uh, uh, phylogeny here, the showing us, or this phylogenetic tree showing us uh, where pteropods evolved and archosaurs are. Well, 66 million years ago, we had the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, which wiped out the vast majority of these. All the, the theropods were wiped out except for birds. Uh, and within archosaurs, birds and crocodilians are the only remaining groups today. So we, <laughs> we lost most of the archosaurs uh, due to the Cretaceous tertiary extinction. And we're not going to talk much more about crocodilians, although bearing in mind that <clears throat> There has been a lot of evolutionary history here. Most of that has been wiped off the earth uh, now only existing as fossils with crocodilians and birds being very distantly related groups that are each other's closest relatives today. So at the uh, Cretaceous tertiary extinction, we had four groups of birds that persisted. So we had birds at this time and, and birds after it. But what we did is we put a big bottleneck. So only a few groups of birds made it through there. So we have the paleonates. So these are things like ostriches and tinamous and some of those uh, uh, groups of birds. Uh, the anseriforms. So those are ducks, geese, and swans, and screamers, and some of those others. Uh, galliforms. So those are, of course, chickens, turkeys, any kind of bird that you might describe as fowl or an upland game bird. It's, a, it's another one that's that's pretty nice to remember. So uh, gallus uh, means chicken and form means shape. So shape of a chicken. And then, of course, neo aves. So these are the modern day birds, uh, passerines and others. So, again, where does this leave us today? How many groups of birds do we have on or how many species do we have on Earth? Well, currently on Earth, uh, uh, we have about 10,000 species of birds. Of course, we're, we have major conservation issues with our birds, uh, and we're losing species of birds at an unprecedented rate. Um, but we currently have about 10,000 species of birds. And with those adaptations in mind, some species have kind of walked back some of these adaptations they had. So, for instance, the common loon and other loons 
they have a a solid skeleton. They don't have that highly pneumatized skeleton we saw in other birds. Uh, they're they have very solid bones, which is a, a readaptation for diving. Also, you have birds like the common merganser. They don't have teeth. So this picture on the right, they don't have teeth, but their bill has developed these like uh, uh, carotenized uh, protrusions that function very similar to teeth. It's almost like they re-evolved their own version of teeth. So, so we've seen some of that. And bird diversity is incredible today. Uh, so on Earth, we've got the smallest species of bird, the, the Cuban bee hummingbird, only about two inches long there on the left. And the largest bird, the uh, ostrich in Africa, which grows to about nine feet and can be up to 300 pounds or even more at times. So we've got uh, an enormous diversity of sizes. But this is these are species we don't have in Kentucky, right? So we have in Kentucky also a pretty enormous breadth of species. We have our smallest bird, the ruby-throated hummingbird, that little guy on the left. That's the male, of course. And then the trumpeter swan, which can be upwards of 40 pounds at times, quite, quite a large bird. Both species are capable of flight, uh, incredible diversity. We have roughly 250 species of bird in Kentucky, which is, of course, very exciting for me as somebody who studies birds. Uh, some of them in Kentucky, anyway, we have these sort of one hit wonders. Uh, so like the, the belted kingfisher is the only kingfisher we regularly see here in Kentucky. Uh, and the cranes, we basically only have one species, the sandhill crane, although uh, whooping crane, a federally endangered species, does, does move over and uh, uh, occasionally seen in the state. Um, so some of those groups are one hit wonders, if you will, and others are extremely diverse. So the perching bird order or the songbird order, Passeriformis, is, is they constitute more than half of the birds that we have in the state, more than half our 250 species, with some families being super diverse. One of them called Perulidae are the warblers. This is a very, very diverse group of, of songbirds that we can find in Kentucky. So, so we don't need to dwell on this too much, but it, it's worth taking a moment to remember how we've gotten to the place that we are with birds. And it, it's a pretty incredible path. I mean, sometimes it feels a little weird to think of birds as being uh, derived from reptiles or actually even just being reptiles. But in a sense, that almost makes them more special. I mean, even just today, I, I haven't had a chance to go out in the field and look for birds today. But I just on my way rushing into the office today, saw many species of birds, American crow, morning dove, American robin, European starling, house sparrow, northern cardinal, rock dove. Uh, and I'm sure without very much effort at all, I could see many more species. Uh, and, and probably you listeners have seen many species of birds today. And I think it's worth just reflecting on the history that, uh, that we took to get our birds today and appreciate the diversity of birds that we have on Earth and, and in Kentucky. And with that, um, I'll uh, sign off and looking forward to talking to you all more about birds next time. Thank you.